Okay. Can you hear me all right? Okay, then let's start. Oh, where we were last time was that we were doing the three kinds of being, the three modes of being that Heidegger talks about. It's, I would say that he thinks they're the only ones there are because he certainly writes 99% of the book as if he thought they were the ahistorical, cross-cultural modes of being. Namely, there's equipment in any culture, you would think, and uh, objects or substances that people can stare at and note the properties of. And there are human beings whose way of being is always existence. And yet, there's a page somewhere, I won't even bother to look it up, where he just amazingly says, well, and maybe these ways of talking don't fit the primitives. That is, some culture, I presume, who, who has to totems and who thinks that uh, equipment is sacred things and that you use them not to cut down the wheat, but you do use them because the gods told you to or something. Anyway, I, I wouldn't think, I wouldn't even mention it, except that it shows that he's not trying to do some traditional philosophical Kantian move to tell you that about some necessary universal conditions. What he's doing is telling you that in all the uh, forms of Dasein he's ever experienced or read about or, and so forth, uh, these three ways of being exhaust the ways of being that, that, kind of, that Dasein encounters. And so let's go on like that. Uh, I mean, I think there's nothing more to say about the strange possibility that there are exceptions. The third way, because well, we've done now equipment and its way of being, the two hand and height, readiness to hand, and we've done uh, objects, substances, better to call them substances than objects since Descartes invents the notion of objects and for him, objects are always objects for subjects. Heidegger is just going back to Aristotle's normal understanding of, of every sort of entity, namely that it's a substance, period. It, it, a lot of them would be around whether they were any people around or not, sub, where subjects, subjects only seem to, uh, objects seem to correlate with subjects. So we'll talk about substances. The way of being of substances is, of course, we talked about that, that they are self-sufficient and have properties that are, with certain qualifications, also self-sufficient. And we got up to Dasein. And Dasein, remember, is us. And, or when he, Heidegger, Heidegger sometimes says later, and it sort of helps sometimes to say it that, this way, Dasein, he talks about the Dasein in us. That is, it's whatever it is about human beings that makes them make their being an issue for them. And uh, that's the Dasein in us. And if, if it turns out that dolphins are worrying about their understanding of being or making it an issue for them, then, Dasein, then uh, dolphins would have Dasein in them. Heidegger doesn't think that there's any, uh, doesn't have any reason to believe that there's anything but people who, ha who uh, have a, a interpretation of what it is to be a person built into their practices. But we, so again, we're just for straight approximation, we're just going to call us Dasein, or our, well, yeah, we are Dasein. What is our way of being? That is, that our way of being is to make um, our, our being an issue for us, and that's what's called existence, remember. That's how far we'd gotten last time. And, uh, yeah, problem, worry? Ah, well, interestingly enough, in being in time, they just don't come into the questions. They, they're substances, I, I obviously, because they aren't equipment, or they can be, but they're always substances. But later Heidegger, a little later, five years after being in time, wrote a big fat book, half of which is about boredom and half of which is about animals. I don't, there's no big connection there. That's just how it turned out. <laughs> and, uh, and there, but it's not very interesting what Heidegger says about animals. It's derivative from what the uh, ethnologists were saying. He says animals ha are, uh, they're, they're not things, they have an environment, 
It's, but that's not a world. Animals, but they have something like a world. And so anyway, if you're interested in animals, I can, you come to office hours and I can tell you where to read about it. But you won't, I'm afraid, learn deep things about animals from Heidegger. Uh, but so that's a, that's, that's a sensible question. Now, so, so let's go to Dasein's being being an issue for it. I talked about that last time already, so I don't want to spend a lot of time going over it. Um, this is, we're on page 32 of Being in Time, where all this happens in a condensed way so that my copy is all scribbled up, and yours should be too. Uh, so, and you find him saying on page 32, uh, the second paragraph, oh, by the way, I have to tell you, I'm always going to be giving a second page number. How many are reading it in German? I know at least one person is reading it in German. Hi. I hope there are more. Good, too. Many more. And I'm, I'm glad if people are reading it in German. Did I see another hand? And bringing good, and bringing the German to class, because it might always be the case that though I have read it sort of in German, I mean on and off, I may have just overlooked some mistranslation or some better way of saying what's going on. And if you find when you read the German that it's illuminating and we should be paying attention to it, you can either come, uh, raise your hand and tell me or come in after uh, to office hours. Office hours turned into a nice di sort of discussion section of, for the first week in which there were about, I don't know, six or seven people coming with various questions. In office hours, if you, were wanna, if you wanna talk about Heidegger, which is mostly what anybody coming to my office hours would wanna do, I'm not an advisor uh, right now. Anyway, and some, I'm already talking to somebody about Heidegger or two or three people. Don't be shy, come on in. I mean, it seems a, a waste of everybody's intellectual energy to go take up interesting questions that arise from the lecture one by one, each person, each, each one in, in individual. If you've got some individual problem or question or something, I can always certainly throw out everybody for, for a while. But in general, treat my office hours as a supplementary discussion section. And now, I was saying about the numbers on the sides of the page. Those, of course, are the German edition numbers. So on page 32, there's a 12 there. I'm going to, and I want to read this passage that right below the, where the 12 is. So I'm going to always try to give the German number, partly because I want to be sure the people uh, who are reading the German are on, that, on the page, but secondly, because it will help you find out where we are. See, if I say 32, and then I say 12, right below 12, then you know where we are. So Dasein is an entity which does not just occur among entities, rather it is ontically distinguished by the fact that in its very being, that being is an issue for it. And I said, I believe I already said this, that Dasein, I put it, Dasein takes a stand on its being or has an interpretation of what it is to be a human being. That's fine, except it's misleading. But in the same way that an issue for it is misleading. It makes you think that Dasein has to actually be, so to speak, worrying about, wow, what is it to be a human being? I guess maybe it's like this or like that. I mean, Dasein can do that, but uh, Heidegger thinks that uh, the, the German peasants, whom he likes a lot, and when he was invited to become a professor in Berlin, he said, no, he has to stay in Freiburg, which is some little town in the sort of boonies of Germany, because that way he gets to talk to the peasants. And it's important that Heidegger that's one of the reasons I think Heidegger manages to be so original. I mean, he knows all the stuff that philosophers know, but he knows lots of stuff about skiing and planting crops and drinking the local wine and generally experiencing things uh, the way the peasants do. He writes about it in one place where he talks about what Van Gogh's painting of the peasant shoes show us about the life of them. But what the, why all I want to say right now is they can be what Heidegger would call authentic, that is they can be taking a stand on their being and doing a very, so to speak, good job of it, meaning that they are, what they're doing reflects what it is to be a human being uh, uh, without any, having any thinking about it. So it's saying it's an issue for them or saying that they take a stand on it is somewhat misleading. I gave you this example, uh, I, the last time I said, how about a sacrificial mother? Uh, the, these examples are good from family therapy. Some kid can be, from a family therapist's point of view, understanding him or herself as the bad child in the family. 
but that doesn't mean that they have to say anything or think anything. It just means they have to behave in certain family situations so as to take, take the heat. And, th th but th and maybe the best way to deal with this, since you're going to have to keep saying this to yourself to the, for the whole semester, since the you're going to be worrying about what Dasein is, is Kierkegaard's way of putting it. Heidegger's getting this from Kierkegaard. Heidegger gets lots from Kierkegaard. But Kierkegaard defines the self and says, the self is a relation that relates itself to itself. Well, that is the most abstract way. You could say it. It's not, you don't say it's an issue. You don't say it's a stand. But you say that, that somehow in being a, 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 a self or a Dasein, uh, you are relating to what it is to be a self or a Dasein. So think that if you, if you need to. Okay, I'm going to go on reading this. Let's see, there is an issue for it. Uh, but in that case, this is a constitutive state of Dasein's being, and this implies that Dasein in its being has a relationship toward that being. You see, he's really there. He's got the Kierkegaard. The Dasein is a relation which relates itself toward itself. A relationship which itself is one of being, and this means further that in some, that in some way in which Dasein understands itself in its being, that to some degree it does so explicitly. Aha, that's interesting. I usually don't read the quote that far. Now I have something I have to explain. It, see if, I, if it helps, it. it is peculiar to this entity that with and through it be, its being, that being is disclosed to it. Mm. Well, I think what you have to say is when it, does, when it understands itself explicitly, I want to read that, that it manifests in itself in its behavior what its relation to its being is. So the bad child in the family does what bad children in the family do without having to say that. And with, but the, the, it, it becomes, I, I wonder about the explicitly, time for the German. That's why I'm glad these people are with the German. What's getting translated uh, that Dasein understands itself to, in, to some degree explicitly? I'm just, you know, every, this book is so dense that every, I mean, I, though I've read it so many times and lectured on it so many times, every once in, at least once or twice in lecture, I come across something where I suddenly realize I don't understand what he's talking about. Uh, <laughs> why is he saying explicitly? And he, what's the German? Ausdrücklich? Ausdrücklich. Oh, dear. Well, that's explicitly. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't know what to say. I don't think that's the right thing to say, Heidegger. I think he should have said that it manifests in its behavior the way it relates to its being. I mean, I don't see that the... the Schwarzwald, the Black Forest pre peasants do anything about their understanding of being explicitly or think anything. So you, you can either read it your way, in which case you're going to run into problems somewhere, I'm sure, or read it my way, because I think that what I'm saying fits with what Heidegger's trying to do. Uh, and so it's, it's being is disclosed to it. I guess what that means is it's got some sense of what it is to be a human being or to be the bad child in the family or be the sacrificial mother. That is, it's not completely, so to speak, in the dark with respect to that, but it's also not making it explicit. That's, that's important. Just It sounds like I might be making more of a fuss about it than I need to, but Heidegger's trying, and I've got to say this over and over as I read him, and every time I read him and teach him, I get more and more amazed and impressed and convinced to understand people behaving at the absolutely rock bottom way they behave. With you, you, they can do complicated things like think about theories. They can do complicated things like think about what it is to be a human being. They can do less complicated things like thinking about the doorknob as they go out the door. But Heidegger wants to talk about what we do when we cope with things, that is deal with things in our translation talk at the most ground, unreflective, unthinking, totally absorbed, totally involved level. That's be, and that's how he's going to overthrow 2,000 years of philosophy because he's going to get, so to speak, to something more pervasive and beneath and the condition for being able to do whatever it is any philosopher before him has ever thought about. And it turns out, when you describe this, what, what I would call absorbed coping, uh, and he called this absorbed, unfortunately, he uses the word falling. When he, you'll hear him talking, talking about Dasein falling. When you do, you don't want to think of sort of religious things about the fall. You don't even want to think of sort of secular things about, say, 
diversion and then you know, turning away from trying to uh, live a life that manifests what it is to be human. Or to, or falling is, is being absorbed in, and sometimes he, he talks that way, uh, so that, my, my, to help you, I mean, if, if you, there is an English use of the word falling, which is not very common, but it, you, you say to uh, somebody, they fell to work, meaning they just dug in and got involved in whatever they were working on, they weren't thinking about it, they weren't planning, they, they, they were absorbed in their work. That's this rock bottom way of being that Heidegger's interested in. And that's why I don't want him to talk about making the, the question of your being explicit, because that's not ground level. Uh, that's not the finalist way, the basicest way that we are involved with things and with ourselves. Yeah. Well, that's good. That's what I like. That's why I turned explicit into manifest. You've got to manifest it. You can't just sort of sit around and, and imagine you're going out the door. You've got to really do it. Or, that the, or to take another, to the other opposite extreme. If, if, if my ultimate stand on my being is to be a professor, well, that's something you've got to do. Uh, you, I can't sit at home and read books all the time and then say I'm a professor or only come occasionally to lecture or whatever or talk so quietly nobody can hear me. And, th and there's all sorts of things you do when you're a professor to manifest it. And, but I think it was my sort of identity to be a professor long before I ever asked myself sort of what, are, what, what am I here for and what's my vocation and calling and so forth. And uh, I was the, the important thing I was doing it manifesting it, and that's, that's this more rock bottom level. I didn't have to ask myself, what equipment do you use to be a professor and how do you use it? It's all just, I just grew up in it. Uh, another hand, did you have a hand up? Uh-oh, it's always bad to look ahead. Let's see where, what, what, okay, what happens there? Oh, about being ontological and pre-ontological. I was gonna get to that. Whoa, that's even worse, isn't it? That's disaster. <laughs> well, let's read it. Let's read it because, that because the, the, the issue is whether we are really ontological or what Heidegger calls pre-ontological. And that's a, just a terminological distinction, but it's very important. Ontology is the explicit understanding of being. It's an ology, like, like a genealogy or, or a geology or whatever. It's a logos. It's a story, of, a explicit theoretical, I'm not sure theoretical is quite right, an explicit story about uh, existence, in this case, would be to be ontological. Uh, and Heidegger is doing ontology. Being in time is ontology. But most people don't do ontology. And now, so he needs another word for all that we've just been talking about. G g having somehow a stand on your being, an issue, or being related to yourself, and having some sense of that, and, and manifesting that. What are you going to call that if not ontological? Well, he just calls it pre-ontological, meaning that's the sort of stuff out of which you could form a theory of, or a, or a, a, a discipline, I guess. I, a theory is too bad, because it sounds like you to sort of stand back from it all. And it's very important in Heidegger, it's hard to say everything at once, that you can't sort of stand back from what it is to be a human being, concerned about your own being, and have a theory of that. So, but, uh, but you can have a discipline of that. And he talks about in one phrase, which he later, I think, regretted, and which people constantly beat him over the head with, but I think he meant it when he said it. He says later on in the book, I couldn't turn to it, that being in time is a Wissenschaft von Sein. It's a discipline of, about being, where Wissenschaft gets usually translated because there's no other way to translate it as science of, but that's not exactly right because history is a Wissenschaft. It means a discipline. So, so to do ontology is to make it the discipline to think about being, but we don't do that, except in this course, but uh, people don't normally do that. And so, but they've got all the material, so to speak, to do it. So they're pre-ontological. Is that going to help with that paragraph or am I still in trouble? 
Let me read it now, and I'll read the paragraph, because maybe it'll help me. Here, being ontological is not tantamount to developing an ontology. So if we reserve the term ontology for that theoretical inquiry, gee, I was trying to save him from that. Uh, German readers again, do I, I can't believe, that must be Wissenschaft. No? What is it? What? Theoretisch. The theoretisch, oh, goodness, poor Heidegger. I don't know what to make of all this. Um, I mean, again, I, you can read theoretical so that it just means a discipline. He certainly doesn't think it's a theory in the technical sense of theory that he develops later, where to have a theory is to de-world, is to step outside of our situation and uh, study things from nowhere. Uh, there's this famous line from Nagel that science is the view from nowhere. Heidegger thinks that too. He just doesn't say it. And, and certainly he thinks that's a good idea. He's not criticizing it. He likes science. I'll argue that later because some people think he doesn't. But I mean, his, his major when he was an undergraduate was uh, physics and math. Uh, so, uh, so he's not against theory and he's not against stepping outside the world and the whole human situation and contemplating, say, uh, galaxies and electrons and so forth. So, but he certainly doesn't think you can do ontology from there. You can only do ontology from within the human condition. You're always already in it to talk like Heidegger. You are, to even more jar jargon you have to get used to later, in the hermeneutic circle. That is, in the in circle of interpretation. You're already interpreted and everything you're dealing with is already interpreted by you, but even more by the culture you grew up in, and you can only do anything or think anything from inside there uh, that has to do with human beings. So I, I don't understand that. Maybe there's, you know, when, you, when, there, when things start piling up that you don't understand, it may be that you've got the wrong paradigm. So I have to be open to the fact that the two, that it doesn't usually happen twice in one lecture that he says something that I think he shouldn't say. Yeah. Oh, I see. Oh, does he? Let's hope. Oh, good. The reserve the for the theoretical inquiry devoted to the, But if we reserve ontology for that, then we will, then we're pre-ontological. But the trouble is, what's ontology going to mean except the theoretical, I mean... Well, where is this fundamental ontology? Uh, now, the uh, fundamental ontology is not going to be theoretical. Okay, let's read it that way. Good. I, I, David will get me out of this. So, so he, you could try to do theoretical ontology. Philosophers have been doing it all for 2,000 years. That is, step outside the human condition, like Plato's uh, person who finally climbs out of the cave and looks at the ideas head on <coughs> from, from nowhere. Uh, you, you can do it. I mean, at least you can claim to do it. I don't think Heidegger thinks anybody really succeeds in it. But... Uh, uh, that, that kind of ontology, you could call it theoretical ontology, and that's certainly not how he's using the term. But then how is he using the term? What is fundamental ontology? To, to, we still don't know what ontology means. Well, then there's no difference. Okay, well, okay, that's right. So let's, let's do it that way. What, so you don't get confused. So if you thought ontology was what philosophers traditionally thought ontology was, then you'd have to call... You, you couldn't call Dasein being ontological. You'd have to call Dasein being pre-ontological. And now you have to, it's still, still pretty murky, because now you have to switch over and say, well, pre-ontological, but not because it could ever turn out to be a theoretical discipline, but pre another kind of ontological. That's what David is saying. Uh, namely, what I'm going to do right now, explain fundamental ontology. That's, that's what you are supposed to be doing. But let, we have to get there. Uh, to, it's a little while yet. Um, so existence is our way of being. I'm still talking about that. Uh, and we did, we talked about, uh, well, no, I never read the passage that said it, so I'm going to read that right now. So the, the be it, Dasein's essence, he, you'll read later, essence is existence, so I can say it now. Dasein's essence is to be the being that takes this, makes an issue of its being. And when it does that, what, what is its way of being? Well, its way of being is what Heidegger is going to call existence. So there we are back at that again. That's at the bottom of 32. We're still in the page 12. That kind of being toward which Dasein can comport itself in one way or another. 
and always does comport itself somehow, we call existing. That's the, again, we, weird way to put it, but that's, that's the kind of being, of beings that take a stand on their own being. And now we're going to call that existence, and then when you do that, you, now we have to skip to go back to 67. Heidegger does, strangely enough, the same thing twice. And you may have noticed if you've done the reading, which I hope you have, that I've picked out from the introductions, which I don't want to talk about to the end, the kinds of things that he talks about in the beginning uh, of the, after the introduction. Because on 67, he goes back to this story about existence, but he adds something which I want to talk about. So, um, and we're on page 42 now of the German. Um, well, he's got to sort out the existence the way he's using it. That's what I want to do here. From the way it's been used in the tradition and in, in common language forever. I mean, usually it makes sense to say God exists if you believe God exists or he doesn't. Or trees and, and trees exist and numbers uh, exist or maybe subsist, but let's say exist for this discussion. Anyway, uh, but he's using existence in this very peculiar way that only human beings exist. That's what he's telling you about. So uh, you have to say in his use of existence, God doesn't exist and trees don't exist and animals don't. That's okay. Stones don't. Dasein does. So th he's saying that in, the, it, in the, about 10 lines down on 67. Uh, we choose to designate the being of this entity as existence. This term does not and cannot have the ontological, and that's traditional old-fashioned ontological, signification of the traditional term existentia. Onto ontologically, existentia is tantamount to a being that in the tradition, as present at hand, a kind of being which is essentially inappropriate to the entities of Dasein's character. That's fine. And then he adds this new thing at the next paragraph, the essence of Dasein lies in its existence. That's a big deal. Sartre sort of takes off from there. You want to say something? How do we know what talk last? Oh, well, we don't. I mean, that's the same thing about uh, animals. I mean, I mean, it's further fetched even than dolphins that maybe refrigerators have it. I mean, he doesn't care. I mean, it's not, and it's not an epistemological question. It's a, it's a question, it's an ontological question. He's trying to define what Dasein is, and he takes it for granted that he's going to say things about it that you'll recognize that you are one. But uh, if it turns out that there are those weird gaseous Martians or something who are also Daseins, and I don't know, maybe even refrigerators, uh, then Heidegger doesn't care. Uh, that, uh, he's n and he doesn't ask how, how, he know, wh wh how we would know. That's, uh, he just, he's just telling you how he's going uh, uh, he's to, he's telling you for that he's going to use this term to, to, to explain, not so, to better, to uh, refer to a way of being. And of course, he's not ready to tell you the whole story about that way of being. The, the whole story of that way of being is all of division one of being in time because if that's what existence is, then if you did a story of the structure of existence, then that would be what he calls an existential analytic back on 33. Uh, oh, no, sorry. I don't go back there yet. I was talking about the essence of Dasein being its existence. That's, and I said, that's an amazingly uh, interesting, strong claim that uh, Sartre makes a big deal out of. And Heidegger uh, claims later he regrets having said it at least the way Heidegger misunderstood it. But what it certainly means in, in Heidegger and in Sartre, I think, and I don't think there's such a big misunderstanding over that, is that there, Dasein has no other defining characteristics except that in its activity, it expresses a certain way of taking over itself it, 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 and the, what I'm trying to say is, i got to give you some other, suppose if you're a Freudian and think that people are libido maximizing machines or something like that, if it's a caricature of Freud, don't worry about it. I'm uh, just trying to give you examples. If you're uh, a natural law philosopher and think that, the, that uh, to be a human being, you have a certain uh, natural 
character, and uh, maybe, uh, or if you're a kind of Kantian, you think that the, our essence is to be a, be rational. If you're an Aristotelian, you think that to be a rational animal. I mean, there are all kinds of claims about what the essence of the human being is, and each of them lead. And if you, another one is to be you're a creature of God. Each of those you can see leads to an immensely different way of life. Whether you are a rational animal or a creature of God or a libido machine or something else that the sociobiologists think we are, some kind of just mostly animals enacting whatever the genetic code for this kind of animal is. So, but he's making this claim. None of that captures what it is to be a human being. And then you want to say, well, what does? Well, what does is that there is an interpretation of what it is to be human in the culture and you get socialized into it and you may and then you you do believe or can probably do that that you do have a nature and if you get socialized into a christian culture you have the nature of being a creature of gods and if you get socialized into a kantian culture if there is such a thing you would you think that you were ra- in, in, in the berkeley philosophy department there is you would think that you were a, a rational being and so forth. Uh, so, but the fact is the, that you, we have all those different views of what our nature is, which leads to the conclusion that our nature, our essence, let's get back to this kind of talk, is simply to be the kind of being that through their activity gives themselves a nature. Uh, the, the, the best per- statement of it is Pascal. Behind all of the existentialists are, is this super genius Pascal who uh, started figuring it out in the 1600s. Uh, Pascal at one point in, in the Pensees says, custom is our nature. That's what I've just been saying in a, in a long, windy way in one sentence. That is, whatever the culture tells us you, uh, we are, we get socialized into it and take that to be our nature and take the, the, our, our behavior to follow from that. But once you see that, then you see that there isn't any right answer to what our nature is, just that we're capable of having lots of understandings of our nature. And uh, that's it. That's what Heidegger thinks with that phrase. Yeah? Is that the way we think about the nature of the person? Yes. Yes, exactly. That's exactly what it is. To say that custom is our nature is to say we have no nature, which is to say what? That existence is our essence. That's, I'm trying to explain that sense. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, interesting point. No, I think, I used to worry about that, whether when I'm brushing my teeth, I'm manifesting my understanding of being. Uh, I'm not... I've, I've never been able to be sure w- whether I am or not. Uh, I, I'll give you the equipment, so to speak, for thinking about it. I was going to talk about it briefly somewhere here, and probably, and so why not now? Um, that I have a lot to, how many are looking at my commentary and sort of reading along? I just, well, well okay, well, not very many, which is just as well. I'm not, uh, but every once in a while, I get things sort of so interestingly right and so interestingly wrong at the same time that I can't help pointing this out, and I will have to fix it in the next edition. I got a whole interesting story, which when I was thinking about whether we had a nature or not, and how Heidegger thinks about it, I read a sociologist's account of the difference between Japanese and American babies, and you don't have to, I mean, this is philosophy, so you don't have to worry about whether it's true or not, uh, or got, you know, whether, the, whether they've got it right. It's a kind of thought experiment. But anyway, in their, in their thinking, the, the, uh, they say, well, Japanese uh, mothers put their babies in the cradle and sing to them and lull, uh, sort of lull them and rock them and make them want to be contented, whereas American mothers put their babies down in such a way that they crawl around and they sort of talk to them in such a way as to kind of keep their attention and get them all uh, uh, focused. And... Uh, I thought that was interesting. And then my, I had a TA at that point who was married to a Japanese woman. And he said, that's right. I never thought of that. When, when, when my wife puts the baby in the cradle, she always puts the baby back in its crib or wherever on its back. Whereas you, often you, you know, the American mother, so he claimed, put the baby on the, you know, 
walking around or crawling around. The, the important point I'm trying to make of all this is two things. One, it's right to give this example because I want you to realize that understanding your nature or, or having a, an understanding of your way of being uh, doesn't require thinking about it. Doesn't require having any intellectual content. We're back at the ground level again. At the ground level of babies, the, the moral of the paper by the, psych, the sociologist was that by the time the baby is a few weeks old, it's already either in a kind of holistic, nurturing way, a way of life, which is supposed with well, the Japanese way, or it's already being beginning to relate to itself in the world as a kind of isolated, energetic individual out to satisfy their, d its desires. And the, I, the conclusion of the article is by, the, by a few weeks of age, the baby is a Japanese or American baby. And uh, all I want you to think is, well, it's certainly not by virtue of its beliefs that it is, or it's, uh, it, it has nothing, and, or you know, it doesn't think that it is, it doesn't think anything. It's, it's got no language and it's just a little baby. But it's got a certain style of practices that in, let's say roughly, a nurturing style of being and we've got a kind of aggressive style of being. I heard a, a proverb, or the, I, I don't know if you all know this, maybe it's common, I just came across it lately. You get a, to sum this up about Japanese babies, that uh, th th this leads to a culture in which you could have a slogan like ours uh, that the squeaky wheel gets the oil. And what would be the Japanese equivalent of a proverb like that? Do you know that? The nail that sticks out gets pounded down. Uh, so that was a very different views of, of being, of what it, well, of, of the style. I want to say being for uh, the mo most general thing. But the, the two, there's, so I want to say the mistake in my commentary is this mistake I just blurted out, that I s was trying to find out what Heidegger meant by being, and I was looking at the Japanese baby as an example of what Heidegger meant by being. And I don't think that's, that's right because being has got to cover, remember, presence of hand, readiness to hand, and Dasein. And it, but I was, what I was describing is something more specific, a certain style, a certain understanding of what it is to be Dasein that's different in different cultures. It just isn't that the, they, according to early Heidegger, this Heidegger, They've all, everybody's got this, everybody but those primitives, whoever they are, has the same understanding of being. It was confusing to get the Japanese off having one and us having another. But that Heidegger isn't denying that before we even can think, we've already got a certain style of, uh, of existing. Yeah. Yes, yes. We're mostly pre-ontological all the time. You know, your question is great because it gives me a punchline I didn't know I had. The baby already has a pre-ontological pre understanding of being. Not, not its understanding that, that nurturing versus aggressive, but it, the, the baby's already going to begin to understand the rattle. Uh, maybe the American baby is what you throw to get your parents to go and have to pick it up and bring it. And maybe the Japanese baby like a, like a uh, Mexican rain stick where you can r rattle the rattle because it makes nice rainy noises and helps you go to sleep. I mean, they've already beginning to get an understanding of equipment. I presume maybe they, when they lie and look at the thing over their head, if they've got one of those, they already are beginning to see enti objects with properties and so forth. Uh, so that you, you, I think preontological is what every Dasein is as soon as it's got any kind of uh, stand, any, well, yeah, as soon as it starts to relate to something or others, uh, substances and equipment and itself. When it's starting to relate to itself, that third kind, that's what I'm calling the style of its existence, it's got that too, and that's part of what's preontologic. Well, no, it's got that too. We don't want to, I'm, I'm learning something. I'm, I mean, I, I'm not right here learning it, but over the last, I don't know, year or so, I, I've got to keep reminding myself that ontology has only to do with the being. It's that it's the most general level. Of, uh, I'll have to specify that more in a minute. And so I don't, I keep wanting to not lapse into saying that the style of things is 
different. A, a little footnote on that, real quick. I mean, it's not, it's not that it, it, what I'm saying is really wrong about Heidegger. It's wrong about early Heidegger. The big move from early Heidegger to late Heidegger, which takes place about five years after being in time is, he decides that there are different understandings of being in various cultures. And lots of cultures don't even have an understanding of being. I'm sure he would say that, of, probably say that of the Japanese. They, they, you, to have an understanding of being is a very unique thing where all the practices have the same style. Whereas in some culture you can have a bunch of practices. I'll give you the Bali example from Geertz. I mean, the men have their style and it's expressed in the cockfight in Bali and the women have their style and that's in the weaving rituals and so forth. There may not be any one understanding of being. And then Heidegger gets the idea that in our culture we've got one understanding of being and then he gets the idea, no good grief, we've got three. And then by the time he's done, he thinks there are seven different understandings of ep epics in, in, of understanding of being in our culture. But all that, and, and then it begins to look like style's all right. Uh, and, uh, but, and I keep falling into that because I know and teach and like later Heidegger too. But focusing on being in time, let's just do it again. There's only one understanding of being. Uh, we haven't decided how to characterize it, but we know that it's got three aspects, readiness to hand, presence of hand, and, du and uh, existence. Uh, okay, I saw a hand, yeah. Oh, that is a terrific, ter true. I, you're a philosophy major, I bet. Yeah, that, is a, that is a typical philosophy major question, and that is the right question. And Heidegger really worries about it. And I don't know where I was going to fit it in. In fact, I finally left it out of my lecture because I thought, oh, this is so sort of special philosophical worry that I shouldn't worry at this basic state. But he does. So I'm going to tell you about it right now. Heidegger, in the lectures in the 1920s, when he was running up to finally doing Being in Time, published in 1927, he was very concerned with something he called formal indication. And formal indication, formala anzeige, which is, which is the German, I tell you that only because the German gets translated all sorts of different ways. These guys don't understand that it's an important concept for Heidegger and you have to translate it the same every time. And what is formal indication? Well, it's the, so to speak, methodological response to what you say. It's the claim that you've got to start somewhere with a claim that this, this is the essence of such and such, that you want to make it provisional so that further investigation can call it into question and only at the end of your investigation will you either discover you got it wrong or that you had the right to say that. Now, uh, let me read you places where that happens. I'm very interested in formal in indication because it's, uh, as far as I can see, nobody for a long time, maybe they've caught up now, understood what, understood what Heidegger meant by it, except me, and I understood it because I also knew some analytic philosophy. The Heidegger was on to something that Kripke, how many have come across Kripke and, and, and ri rigid designation? Okay, well, Kripke is a very, very, very smart uh, um, analytic logician. And I'll tell you it in Kripke terms first because then you can understand it when Heidegger does it. Uh, Kripke says that we can designate something by some property which could be its defining property and we have to treat it as its defining property provisionally and keep investigating it until we find out whether we really got its essential property. And the, I take it, I don't remember he says this, but I, t I take essential property to mean the property that explains all of its uh, uh, important characteristics or something. So he gives us an example, gold. You can start by saying, I'm going to call that yellow stuff gold and I'm going to investigate that yellow stuff and see what its essence is. And then you discover when you start to investigate, well, one, there's, there's stuff that is, looks like that but it clearly isn't like that, fool's gold, and you discover there's other stuff that really is gold, 
for instance, it doesn't dissolve in any solvent, but it's not gold, it's white, and so forth. But you keep investigating, and finally atomic theory comes along, and finally you discover that gold is, the essence of gold is it has an atomic number, I think it is of 72, is that right? Or weight, I think number. And it turns out, if you have enough theory, that you can explain why it's yellow sometime and, and white sometime and why it doesn't dissolve in the acids and what its malleability and conductivity and all that is, given its atomic structure. So now you know its essence. And, uh, and, you, and you have, you, you, what you tentatively designated as gold, now you can say, well, whatever has these, this property, namely atomic number 72, that and that alone is gold. Let me give you two other quick examples. You start with a flash in the sky and you say we're going to call that lightning. And then after much investigation and culture going along, science finally comes around and tells you it's essentially an electrical discharge, whether it's you see it or not. I suppose lightning goes on in the daytime and we don't see it. Is that right? I've always wondered when I get to this. Uh, but let's suppose so. And the final one is heat. So heat's what feels hot to you, and heat is what makes things boil. Finally, you, des you designate it like that. Finally, after a lot of investigation, you discover the essential thing about heat is that the molecules are bouncing around and bumping into things in each other. So, and that's, now, what's Heidegger going to do? When you're looking worried, have I already said, or can I, should I go on or should I, I better hear what you're worried about. Yes. Yes. Well, let's go to this. But you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I'm glad I asked you because you're the next step. Yeah. How, when Heidegger's talking about formal indication, he wants to talk about how to find the essence of Dasein. That's what's worrying him. That's his question. How do I have the right to say that the essence of Dasein is its existence and not say that it's a creature of God or something? And he does. What he do, does is, in effect tell you that I'm going to provisionally say that's its essence, but I won't know until the end of the book whether it is, and whether it is or not will depend on whether I can make a, 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 a totally coherent understanding of everything that's important about human beings and how it all hangs together using that as my clue. Now, uh, and, but he's not, as you're saying, talking about natural kinds like electricity and gold and uh, heat but he's talking about some other thing, which are other something, which has its own essential structure, he, he thinks. And he thinks that Dasein has an essential structure. But now we have to find the places, the two places. And now since I decided not to talk about the designation, I know how to find the best one. The very beginning of the second part of the, of the set, di Division Two, where he summarizes what he's done, it comes out clearly. This translation sort of messes it up. So here, if you get to page 231, which is, that's the German, if you get, that's 274, you see him making just the, the RISA de designation or formal indication move. See, he says, uh, about six lines down, when we came to analyze this being, namely Dasein, we took as our clue existence, which in anticipation we designated as the essence of Dasein. This, uh, this term, existence, formally indicates that Dasein is an understanding, well, potentiality for being is very bad, but ability to be is better, but we won't worry about that right now. There's an understanding ability to be, which in its being makes an issue of itself. So what he's saying there is uh, just what I said he was saying. He's going to take and give some description of what its essence is, but he understands even here when he's summarizing all of Division I, it's still provisional. It stays provisional, in fact, never gets unprovisional because he never finishes being in time. <laughs> but, uh, but, but he gets far enough. I'm going to tell you by the end of the lecture, if I make it to there, if not next time, what the whole picture was going to be that would, would have put it all together uh, and why it's called being in time. But, uh, but right now, that's enough about formal indication except for one further thing, which wouldn't, won't be relevant till we get to Division two is that Heidegger thinks that we have generally a tendency to cover up the real essence of things, particularly if it's somehow disturbing to us. So that when he talks about guilt, when he talks about death, he starts out with a definition of, of them in our ordinary way, and he shows 
radically. The death means practically the opposite of what we think it means, or what it indicates. Death indicates the essential something that death is, it indicates is entirely different than what we think, that it's some type, like that my student John Hoagland used to say, croaking. That is some kind of an event that happens at the end of your life. Anyway, so, and uh, he does it, he does it with time even. He does it with language. He, he's con ex and now comes this exception. That's why I'm saying this. It just so happens that he really it would make no sense to begin this book with the wrong definition. So he has to say that provisionally he happens to luck out and get the right one because he's written the whole book already. But he, want, but he, but he does want to answer you and say that even though he happens to get the right one, he doesn't claim it's the right one. He claims it's provisional. Good. Yeah. Definitely. That it will account, just as you want gold, just as the molecular theory of heat's going to have to account for every important thing that heat does, not accidental things like uh, be extra strong in the Congo or something, but all the sort of physical things. And so, yes, he's got to account for every important aspect of human being before he can say that. And then one of the things he's got to do, this is what I'm going to try to say briefly at the end, is show how the three modes of being are all rightly called modes of being. What do they have in common? It doesn't look like they have anything in common, uh, readiness to hand, presence of hand, and existence. But then, they're, then the, how come they're all called modes of being? That's the, when, if he can do that, then he's ready to say, yeah, I got it right with my provisional indication. Okay. okay. Ready to go on. Let's go on. I, 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 there's so many loose ends. I, 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 thought I should tell you sort of whether you are jaws on when you're brushing your teeth. Uh, we've left that one aside. Have I said anything in the meantime that's supposed to help you understand or me understand that? Uh, I don't know whether uh, yeah I see maybe that that's the wrong kind of question and I keep falling into it and that was a tr it's a kind of trap I mean, if you want to know whether the, the style of being, say, of being nurturing or, or being aggressive, or now our style of being, Heidegger says, is to have a technological understanding of being, whether that shows up when you're brushing your teeth, whether the Japanese brush their teeth in a nurturing way and we brush our teeth in a technological way, I wouldn't be surprised. But anyway, it's not the right problem to ask here because the question here is, of course, it shows up when you're brushing your teeth because you're using equipment to brush your teeth. And we're not talking about styles of being. We're talking about modes of being. So, you do, so I, never should, I never should let myself ask myself how uh, much the Dasein way of being permeates everything. The, the Dasein way of being is manifest in everything we do when we're using equipment or when we're staring at things or when we're taking up our culture's understanding of being and acting on it, uh, period. Now, back to this. Um, where are we? We're, I'm going to give you some terminology. I was way, I'm on the first half of page one of my lecture, but that's all right. Uh, so uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about was just terminological things. That Heidegger talks about existential and existential, you've got to get used to all these variations on existence because existence is very important for Heidegger. So back to page 32, page 12, where he says, uh, I hope, uh, though I don't see it yet, um, hmm, maybe he doesn't. Somebody, when you see existential, let me tell me about it. Oh, here it is, 33. I got it wrong. Uh, okay, so at the top of 33, still on page 12. Dasein always understands itself in terms of its existence, in terms of a possibility of itself. All oh, that's pretty abstract, and I can't help to make it any clearer than I've done it, so I won't say more. To, to be itself or not itself, that's certainly not going to help. Dasein, for the, at this stage of what we're talking about, but Dasein has already chosen the possibilities of itself uh, or got into them or grown up in them already. That's, uh, oh, do I have to talk about that? 
That's Division II issues. That's whether Dasein is going to be authentic or not. That is whether Dasein is going to manifest in its behavior some particular cultural understanding of what its essence is or whether it's going to manifest in its behavior that it has no essence so that, he can't, so that it can't draw conclusions about how to live as a rational animal or a creature of gods and so forth. And that's got to get settled by each particular Dasein's way of being, again, without thinking about it. Presumably the German peasants already do this right. But, the, so the under, but whatever you want to say, say is, and we've got to just deal with it because he talks about it here, that when you're talking about what some particular Dasein stand on its being, that's existential. When you talk about the general structure of a being whose way of existence, whose way of being is existence, then that's existential. That's just what he's doing, you see. He talks about the existential, and then he goes, the question about the structure, I've skipped down a little, the aims at the, uh, aims at the analysis of what constitutes existence, the context of such structures we call existentiality, it's analytic, has the character of an understanding which is not existential, but existential. And the, so, so this whole book, all of it, is an existential analytic. It's an attempt to lay out the whole structure of the, of the way of being which is existence. Uh, this is, and that's to do an existential analytic, and that's just so you get used to that. Um, and, it's not, and it doesn't have to do with reflecting and believing, and that's the, where I was going to talk about the Japanese baby that I did. But I, I, but I did want to read a place. I keep saying that it's important that we don't have to, and the Japanese baby does illustrate it uh, in a way, is we get socialized into all of the, our practices, that is, our uh, manifesting uh, our understanding of being, but also manifesting the style of our understanding of being, and also manifesting whether we understand that we don't really have a nature in we have that that is the, 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 the existence is our essence. All of that uh, is something that uh, we get we just pick up from the culture. Uh, on the bottom of 213 it happens, but I think it's important in the lo in, and to see it. Ha he mentions it here. Um, he doesn't talk about it much. Uh, this is the bottom of 213. It's in the German 169, about two sentences into the paragraph that begins this way. This everyday way in which things have been interpreted is one in which Dasein has grown in, has grown in and I think the better way to translate the German here is has grown into from the start. Um, you could translate it from the first instance, but it just wouldn't make any sense. It's one in which Dasein has grown into from the start. With ne with ne that's the Japanese baby. With never a possibility of extrication. It's always going to have that style. Uh, it, in it, out of it, and against it, all genuine understanding, interpreting, and communication, all rediscovering and appropriating is performed. And so that's just... Um, part of saying we're always in an understanding of being. Now it's important to make another, uh, did I say that wrong again? I'm falling back into later Heidegger. We are always in, uh, how does he say here? Uh, a way of interpreting Dasein. That, that's, so we're always in a way of interpreting Dasein. That's what it is to exist. You never can step out of it. N and you're always... Uh, doing what you're doing, even rebelling in t inside, inside of it and so forth. Uh, and uh, now another distinction but that you need between facticity and factuality. Uh, because now you want to say, and probably if I let you have time, somebody would say that, well, but there are features of human beings that don't seem to have anything to do with this whole interpreting business. I mean, let's take an example, being male or female. That's just the characteristic of us as organisms. We've got, and, and uh, that's Heidegger would say, yes, that's factuality. But what's interesting about us, and this is sort of related to whether you're brushing your teeth or not in the style of your culture, is that all the factuality about us gets taken up and interpreted, if, if we're a Dasein, 
and because, because our mode of e being is existence. So, for instance, male uh, turns into masculine, and di different cultures, this is the gender business, uh, different cultures go have different ways of understanding the gender masculine and feminine, even though the, the biological facts uh, that, that there are males and females is cross-cultural. And so Heidegger has a notion of facticity, he calls it. Facticity is sort of the way of understanding yourself in your behavior that you are stuck with given the culture that you're raised in. So you're stuck with pretty much, uh, and you can vary it a bit and rebel against it a bit, a certain understanding of masculinity, whether we, you never thought about it or not, and you couldn't ever get to the bottom of it if you did think about it because it's so pervasive in how you stand. And how, you know, There was a time when I first came to Berkeley when there were a lot of consciousness-raising groups, and women and then later men too tried to understand sort of what, the, what all they had taken up from their culture in, in, in their facticity and particularly in their gender, and it, I think they've stopped. And no, I think the reason they've stopped, as far as I can make out, I, they're known, now there's not hundreds of consciousness raising groups, I don't think, is probably some people think, well, they sort of answered it. They understand how women enter conversations differently than men and throw baseballs differently than men and so forth. But I like to think that the reason they stopped is that they understood that they're never going to get to the bottom of it, that everything they can discover is is relatively superficial and what they can't notice is the is sort of the tip of the iceberg and that there's so much in, uh, in, the, in just in the, in the whole way of dealing with things that is different because that's the way our culture does it that, that um, they that, and that there's no reason to think you would ever get to the bottom of understanding the style it's, uh, this is again the sense of sort of Heidegger seeing that there's something very basic that you can't take up and make explicit. You can act, it, you, you manifest it all the time. Oh, that's the next thing to say. You manifest it all the time, but it is so pervasive that, and so embodied that you can't make it explicit. It isn't, a it isn't a belief system. We don't have a belief system about what it is to be masculine in our culture. That would be, a, a, be a, an American. That's a joke. I mean, it's got very little to do with what we believe, and probably what we believe isn't even right about it. So what, what is going on there that, I, uh, that, uh, you, that, that Heidegger is getting at? I have certain, I've just forgotten where I'm heading with this. Just a second. Mm -hmm. um, so it's so pervasive. Oh, that's what I want to talk about, but why and how. Ah, yes, okay. Heidegger's words for this is that it's nearest and furthest away. What our facticity our particular style of interpreting our way of being, namely existence, in all of our activity is so obvious, so close to us, that we, we couldn't, we, we got it sort of right, so to speak, in front of us, except it isn't in front of us, it's all around us. And it's so much like the, like the wa water to the fish, it is so much all around us that that though just because it's nearest and pervades everything we do and it, there's no counter class of things and so forth, that makes it the hardest to see and the furthest away. And Heidegger is not trying to do that job in being in time. That is, get at what it is to be a German or what it is to be masculine or anything like that. Though later Heidegger is definitely got himself into this interesting business of trying to see what is nearest and furthest away, namely the style of our existence in the West. But, so, but you, I don't know where I can, I mean, I've gone so far from my notes that I don't know whether I'll ever see again nearest and furthest away. Oh, here we are. Um, I'm asking myself, oh, no, it's too, I'll have to come back to it. Uh, I jumped ahead. So let me go and do what I really want to do. We've got to get to fundamental ontology right away, cause, and as David brought it up. So I'm going to do it by giving you again definitions. So ontic, which as we come across it every once in a while, has to do with entities, properties, characteristics of entities. Ontological has to do with the way of being, and it could. And preontological has to do with acting out the way of being without thinking about it. 
Uh, let's see now. Yeah, and, and now comes the tricky thing. What is fundamental ontology? Well, it turns out, and you can, you've been prepared for this by me very well, I think. That is, it turns out w that we, in, in, in our behavior, as we take a stand on our existence, it's better to be specific, as I understand myself as a professor, I use lots of stuff. That is, I, I uh, take up things as, as equipment. That is, I manifest my understanding of being, of the kind of being of readiness to hand. And thanks to the fact that I do that, there is that kind of being called readiness to hand. Being, being equipment doesn't just sort of lie around whether any people are there or not. It's only because we're here using equipment to do things in order to understand the kind of being that we are uh, that there is uh, uh, readiness to hand. And because we're also the kind of being that can, when we get into a problem, for instance, stare at things, look at their properties, try to put the blob back on the wood and the hammer, we have this capacity to study substances. So, and that's so there is presence at hand. And, it, and we are the being that, so to speak, constitutes or generates, I don't know what the right word ought to be, uh, produces, I, uh, I just don't know. Mm -mm. I think maybe, uh, in a Heidegger jargon, discloses. Let's just use Heidegger's jargon. We are the kind of being that discloses all three ways of being. Readiness at hand, presence at hand, existence. And that's the sense in which we, we, when you do fundamental ontology, what do you do? You study the being that is the basis for all the ontologies. That's on page 34 at the very top. 13 in the German toward the bottom. Therefore, fundamental ontology, from which all other ontologies can take their rise, must be taught in the existential analytic of Dasein. So you know what an existential analytic is? It's lying out the structure of existence. You know that if you work out the structure of existence, you will understand why it is that we have these three under ways of, of, of understanding being, and all of which, therefore, one, they depend on us, and two, we have to say something about them. The, I'm, I'm just going to blurt out a sentence about their depending on us because we're going to spend a lot of time on it later. I've, in effect, told you that modes of being depend on us. And does that make you a high, does that make Heidegger a kind of idealist? And the answer is no. Heidegger says, and I just don't want to take time to find the pages way later in the book, that being depends on us, but beings don't. That means that that there is a mode of being called readiness to hand, and a mode of being we're going to call presence at hand, and a mode of being called existence depends on us, and there wouldn't be any modes of being like that. There would be, the things just wouldn't, there wouldn't be any intelligibility like that if it weren't for us. Intelligibility depends on us. But that whether there are any hammers or not doesn't depend on us. We may, could make sense of hammers and there wouldn't be any. Or there could be things around that we don't have any knowledge of but they're, and uh, uh, they're still there and they still, but, but what their mode of being is is going to be something relative to Dasein. Yes, one. I, uh, for fundamental ontology, it's the top of page 34. I wish I could tell you about being depending on us since I just got there just a second. Anybody know? Um, well, then I will, but I do want to say something real fast, which will be too fast, but at least you can think it over because I promised it. And I'm trying to find where I do it so I can do it as quickly as possible. Here we go. Um, oh, just a boy, I can't resist telling you that it's on page 37. Uh, German, I don't know what, uh, 15, I guess, where, where, where this closest and furthest away is. Dasein is ontically closest to itself and to itself, and ontologically farthest, and pre ontologically, it is not a stranger. That is, you've got to work on it. Okay, but here's, here's what I want to say when you say that the, you've got to have a whole unified theory of all this now. So how does it work? Well, 
the structure of Dasein is to make sense of things, and to make se- or to make sense of itself by using things, and by so that I'm using things to be a professor and so forth. And uh, when you do that, you discover you discover there are these three modes of being: the equipmental stuff, the stuff that are substances, and us. And now the final question you have to ask is, why are there these three, and only in exactly three uh, understandings of being? And now you begin to get a glimmer, maybe, that if you could put this in terms of time somehow, which has three dimensions, past, present, and future, you would understand something about the, three, the threefold structure of uh, everything. Now, I, I'm not even going to try to explain that, but I want to try to uh, uh, tell you one more weird thing. Don't feel you need to know this and don't, and, or understand what I'm saying, but I think it, I promised it. And so we want to know that the, why there are three, and we do that, and, and uh, you can't say it's because it's temporal, but you can say somehow that well, you, you know that you've got it all right, that there are three and only three, if you could map it onto time, which is very fundamental and has three dimensions. But here's a tougher one. And I said I was going to tell you how they were all unified. That's the really hard part. How come these are the three understandings of being? What do they have in common? Well, obviously, if Heidegger's going to make it work, they've got to all have temporality in common. And, the, the, and but how would that work? Well, each of the three kinds of being would have one of the three (coughs) modes of temporality, which is pretty far-fetched, but this is what Heidegger thinks. Dasein uh, is what he calls primordial temporality, and it's... uh, Hmm... Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I haven't said it right. Uh, there are three different... For each of the three modes of being, there is a kind of unity. That's what I have to say. That, that what, it's, that what unifies them all is temporality because for each of the three, there is a unity of, tempor- of a, t- a temporal kind of unity. And the temporal kind of unity is what he calls primordial temporality, which is the temporal structure of... The, what you get in the existential analytic, and you'll get that. Then there's the temporal structure of what you could, one could call uh, pragmatic time. It's the time of equipment and coping. And, he, uh, and in a way, you already get that. Uh, and then there's a kind of time which are the kind that you're used to on clocks, a now time of this moment and then that moment next and that moment, the past, present, and future in that sense. And that's also got its kind of unity. So now, I mean, you're, the, I, I know you're just puzzled and I don't worry about it. I just promised to tell you that the reason he thinks that he's got it right when he provisionally designates the, be, the Dasein as the being who is, uh, the, uh, is existence and when he says existence, yeah, its essence is existence, he owes you a big picture of how all this hangs together. And the big picture of how it all hangs together is that there are three modes of temporality, each of which is unified, and all of them are unified because, and I haven't said this yet, they are derived from each other. So primordial temporality enables you to uh, understand pragmatic coping temporality of equipment, which enables you to understand the moment-by-moment temporality of the ordinary physical world. One question, but it's probably not time to answer. Uh, present, at hand, present at hand temporality is clock time or now time. I didn't say that. It's just this minute and this second and this second. It's the kind of time you're used to. The other two kinds of time, Heidegger has to convince you that they are, they're around. Okay. Yeah. Yes, if, if you came in late and you, di- and you didn't fill out a card, come up right now and fill it out because you've got to do that or you won't be in sections and then you won't be in the course. <laughs>